Okay. So you know you're at a developer meetup when you start with the presentation and all you've got on the screen are terminal and tech center. <laughs> Uh, it's a lot better than slides. <laughs> All right. So uh, how many of you have actually committed code to a Bitcoin wallet? Wow. Nobody, huh? Fantastic. One. Yeah. Cool. Which one? Bitcoin J. Okay. Bitcoin J is fantastic. Yeah. Mike's actually an advisor for our company. Yeah. Our... So we forked Electrum just to be able to give people a good reference implementation that they can hack with and they can use to build applications. So it works the same way that uh, Electrum normally works, which is written in Python. Um, it's one of those wallets where it's split between the client and the server. The server, all it does is it runs a, a Bitcoin node, and then the client does all the key management. And so it's uh, it's really you know somewhat usable for desktop use, and it runs on the server just fine. There are people who are running Electrum as their hot wallet for uh, wallets that do you know a thousand transactions a day, two thousand transactions a day, which in fintech is not a lot, but in Bitcoin is a huge amount. Bitcoin only has maybe uh, 30, 40 thousand transactions a day total. Um, I think caps out at like. We've never seen a day with more than 69,000 transactions. What we did to Electrum is we somewhat improved their BIP32 support to do higher deterministic wallets. And we also took their multi-sig support and we tied it to their BIP32 support. So you can do entire accounts, which are relationships between three extended public keys. So HD wallets work is um, you start with a core secret that uh, you put in mnemonics and it looks like this. And you derive from, hmm? You know, I probably can't. How's that? It's still small. Still small. We can it's go better. Back. Yeah. There we go. That'll do. Okay. So this is the mnemonic for uh, for the seed. All of the Bitcoin addresses in here are derived mathematically from that. You can create sub accounts. And what we did was we took the sub-account infrastructure and we applied a multi-sig scheme to the entire sub-account where you just link three sub-accounts to three different wallets and you step down at address number one, address number two, address number three, and lock step. So I'm gonna do this as if this is running on a server, like Coinbase style where you used to just be holding everybody's Bitcoin and providing a user interface through the web and uh, it was all pooled. We're gonna show how you can use HDM wallets to segregate those out into user funds and to integrate with a third party to keep you from walking away with it intentionally or accidentally. This is, I call this, uh, don't get goxed. <laughs> All right. So you're in the process of generating that at a master level wallet? Then? So what I'm doing here is this master level wallet for the local wallets already been created. It's got a seed, it's got a master public key, and it's got its first account. It's got like Six addresses associated with it? Um, well, you can create as many addresses as you need to within it. Okay. You could have, you know, ten, the, yeah, the you could have 10,000 derivative addresses in the same account. So generally, the best practice is every time an address receives some Bitcoin, you archive it and you move on to the next one. Okay. So, so this makes, you're making parallel trees. You, you start with you're starting with three separate. Yeah, so I'm doing a I'm, you got I'm doing trees. I'm doing here's a master wallet, and I'm going to do one branch from the master wallet per user. Yeah. 
and then that will further branch into as many addresses as that user needs. And the master wallet was built based on that kind of long mnemonic secret? Yeah. And so that mnemonic secret is the core <coughs> secret for your signing server. Right, and that, that's, that's the higher hierarchy yeah. tree. That's right. But so you're saying you're making this instance because you're, this is like a multi-sig thing, so you do three separate... So I'll show you for the first account. Hey, Tariq, yes. what's your phone number? 646. 646-479-4790. So it's asking here to provide a third key. So there's the local key, there's the key it's going to get from our server, and then it asks, it takes as a parameter a third key. So we're just going to take this one that I created here. Um, if you're using this service, if you're using this software to use our service to, uh, to, do, to do custody of somebody else's coin in the back of your web app, then we actually suggest for this third key, what you do is you stash it with an attorney. So it'll create two or three wallets, but because you've got one key and we've got one key and we both have operational integration, it'll be in effect two of two. The reason you're stashing this third key with an attorney is so that someone responsible will have it if one of us go out of business. Yeah, like if your CTO gets hit by a bus. And this is all, you can do this all via the command line too. I'm just using the UX to go fast. So Tariq's phone should ring any second because the service tried to spend his money and uh, didn't have permission to spend that much. So our service, instead, instead of checking back with your app, our service says, no, we got to talk to Tariq first. We think you're trying to steal his money. Somebody's trying to spend 10 million of BTC. So it's that impressive We're done. Not going to work. So what do you do in this situation um, if, uh, if this is happening too often? Maybe our app broke. Or maybe we're offline or whatever, right? If the, if the if all of your stuff's not getting authorized or if things or big payments that you need to do aren't being authorized. That's when you go to our friendly attorney that stored that that stored the third key. And you throw your copy of the wallet into recovery mode. And you can actually create partially signed transactions as a file. And we're working with BitPay to standardize the mechanic, the data set that they use for partially signed transactions for Copay with what we're building into all of our wallet partners. So ideally, every multi-sig wallet at some point relatively soon should be able to sign any, wallet, any transaction it's a party to, regardless of what wallet generated the transaction. We're not there yet. We hope to be there in a few months. We're just going to put this on desktop. And then you take the seed for the other wallet. Restore from seed. So you'll notice this wallet knows nothing about the transactions because you just restored it from seed. It doesn't have any of the multi-sig relationships. It's only got the local wallet. But if you load the transaction, the partially signed one, and click sign, It actually figures out how to sign it, and then it learns the details of the transaction. It, just, it still doesn't know the inputs, but it knows that it could accurately sign it. And then you can broadcast to the blockchain, and I have my money back. So what we've created is a signing service that can participate in partially signed transactions.
that can be slaved to users through out-of-band things like email, phone calls, Google OTP, text messages, so that when you use us, we don't authorize transactions because we believe they're good for you. We authorize transactions because we believe they're good for the users. This can be incredibly important if you're afraid of holding other people's money, which if you work in Bitcoin, you should be afraid of holding other people's money. It's just that simple. Bitcoin is money enough that if you lose it for someone else and they sue you, uh, not only will you have to give them back, but if you can't, you may go to jail. Well, the, the IRS may have to prove their, that you stole it. If you control their Bitcoin, the IRS says you're responsible for it. There's a whole different bracket. Yeah, there's all sorts of stuff. There are consumer <laughs> protection laws related to holding things of monetary value for other people. There are money transmission laws in every state related to holding money for other people. There are um, tax implications, especially around reporting. If you, if you provide financial services to other people and they make income and you know that, then you may be obligated to call the IRS. Uh, speak to your friendly attorney. If you don't have one, you should call Dax Hansen at Perkins Coie. But holding other people's money can be very dangerous. Using a service like this allows you to create an account where you participate in a scheme that holds people's money, but you're not unilaterally holding it. We're holding it together in the context of a contract that the user probably entered into, where we each have our defined roles, and each of us are responsible for stopping the other should they step out of the defined roles. Moves Bitcoin, doing Bitcoin with multi-party multi-sig, moves it out of banking law, which is primarily criminal in nature, back into contract law, which is primarily civil in nature, where arguably it belongs. Also, when you do this multi-party multi-sig, let me get back to that other wallet we were using, Bitcoin Dev Chop. It's easy to segregate the funds per user. So you don't have to rely on So you don't have to rely on your database to keep back your balances. You don't have to attest to balances. The blockchain's tracking it for you. And will attest to each account based on the information you gave us for account configuration. So you use a system like this, nobody can ever claim you misaccounted for their money. Whereas um, if you want to claim that about Coinbase, it's going to be a lot easier. Or about Bitstamp, or about trading. Because in all of those cases, the Bitcoin's kept pooled, the accounts are kept in a database, and um, if a user claims that a particular Bitcoin uh, transaction in the blockchain was a deposit into your service, and you disagree with them, it's going to be he said, she said, all, all lawsuit long. Whereas you configure your accounts like this, all of the accounts, all the addresses in the account will be derivative. User claims there was an address outside of it. We say impossible. We can show you the source code for how the application's written. And it's all tracked, segregated, each fund, each fund separate. Also, because you can manually countersign the partially signed transactions with a third key or any arbitrary M of N if there are other keys, then it's very, very simple if we're down to still recover your systems and recover user funds. You, you only rely on us for uptime so long as you continue to want to use us. If you want to get out, it's not that hard. And you can, uh, you can countersign a sweep transaction that takes as an input all of these transactions. Or if that's too big of a transaction, you can countersign a series of them. But it's, transactions can come out of the wallet from any account. Anyway, so Electrum HTM, it's a fork of Electrum that uh, does multi-sig well, that does BIP32 well, can be ma manipulated from a, U from a user interface or from the command line and uh, it is easy to use to build your apps. We also want to integrate with all of your wallets. Anybody who builds a wallet who, who would rather have it be multi-sig and rather have it be multi-party, we'd love to integrate our service. We'd love to pay you if you get a lot of users. And even if you don't, we'd like to make sure you handle the same standards so your wallet can be compatible with our wallet, can be compatible with BitPay's wallet, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, a quick question, um, apologies for the interruption. Um, uh, <laughs> the Coinbase and this time example, aren't those pool the funds necessary because the transactions or, you know, once you deposit your stuff into Coinbase, are really happening off blockchain on 
on the systems or the blockchain systems of these private companies, so therefore there is really no way to... So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of discussion right now about auditing exchanges. And so I ran an exchange, and this was uh, reconciliation on a Bitcoin exchange. It's the biggest pain in the ass you're ever going to see. Um, because you have to take the actual log files from your hot wallet, and you've got to reconcile them with your log files from your database, which are going to be in a completely different format. And you've got to make sure that every deposit tracks with your hot wallet, tracks up with the deposit in your database, and every withdrawal in your hot wallet tracks up with the withdrawal in your database. And you've got to make sure that all of your other transactions that don't correspond with the wallet or withdraw had double entry bookkeeping and zero out. That reconciliation process is something that at Trade Hill it took us months to develop in terms of how to do it well and good tools to do that and things like that. And I, I doubt to the end of it that our bookkeeping firm actually knew what we were doing. I think for the most part, they were just looking for that everything totaled to zero at the bottom and then they trusted us after that. If we had to pay for an actual audit from a big financial house, I would have expected that to take months and cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. But the Bitcoin blockchain is by its very nature must use triple entry account. Every 10 minutes. So every, every wallet keeps its own books on the payor and the payee side. And the blockchain keeps an independent set of books that's a copy of every wallet everywhere netted up. Yes, yeah, so with, the, with the audit, how, how tough is it to deal with the fact that it's 24 7 trading? I mean, without, without stopping it, I mean, does that add quite a bit of complexity to it, or is that just an afterthought? Well, in terms of balancing dollar and Bitcoin balances themselves, all that really added was more transactions to audit. But in terms of uh, calculating cost basis and giving people brokerage style statements, which by the way, we're the only exchange to ever have done that, ever. And we may, I, I'd be surprised if another one does it anytime soon. But yeah, when you're, next, when you're calculating cost basis and profits and stuff like that, 24 hour trading is a real pain in the ass because you have to, you have to determine whether or not someone make it a trading profit. And you have to have an idea of what baseline and be able to Bitcoin is worth at any given time and things like that. Coindesk makes it a little bit easier because they publish closing prices. But it's all bullshit. It's all so difficult. What we can do with this though, because the blockchain will provide a third ledger that's uh, being constantly audited every 10 minutes by the mining network, is if you settle trades on chain instead of settling them off chain, then you know that they net to zero. Because if they don't, either the transactions they get rejected or you're just paying the miners. So it makes auditing something that automatically happens on a software basis that's easily verifiable and easily netted to zero, at least on the Bitcoin side. It doesn't help you account much on the, on the dollar side, but that's why I trade all these segregated dollar balances by user too. What's that not happening in real time? Well, it depends on your transaction volume. Um, if, you, if you're like, um, like a local Bitcoins or something, and your transaction volume is, ter is in terms of, you know, hundreds or thousands of transactions an hour, then that's not actually that bad. And you can just spit those out into the network. And propagation time is only three or four seconds. And that's good enough for trading purposes, especially since you're holding people's dollars so you can run, so you can roll back trades. And you and us are the only ones countersigning. So where does the double send attempt come from? So in that case, you can settle the blockchain in real time. And you know, who cares if it takes time to get into the blocks? You and us are the only co-signers for the transactions anyway. We can trust each other. If, on the other hand, you're a bit stamp and you're doing hundreds of transactions a minute because people are bot trading against your exchange, then uh, you're probably not going to want to settle in real time. In that scenario, uh, we're perfectly willing to do batch settlement where you provide us with, uh, with insight to your matching engine and you batch up your trades and every eight hours or every 12 hours or every day, we look at the batch, we net it out against our feed from your transaction matching. And if you gave us a batch that actually reflects trading, then we'll countersign the whole thing and we'll post it to the blockchain huge. And there you've got every input to the batch as a net seller 
and then the outputs are changed, net buyer is our fee and your fee. So if you have, I'd say the magic number is if you have more than maybe 10 transactions a minute, you're probably gonna wanna batch them. What exchange did you say you have? So what, what, my, what did you say the name of this? So I, I co-founded a company called Trado with Jared Kenna. It was the second company called Trado. We were an exchange for credit investors. Um, we had, I'd say, 83 or so active clients. Our average trade was over $200,000. We were the place BitPay sold all of their American Bitcoin. We were the place Coinbase bought most of their American Bitcoin. We were, um, most of our clients were venture capitalists, hedge funds, and Silicon Valley billionaires on the buy side. And on the sell side, it was BitPay, the major mining pools, and the major mining manufacturers. Hmm? Um, interesting at Trado and what informed the creation of CryptoCorp is at one point we were holding uh, 100,000 of other people's coins or so valued at about a thousand bucks each. So at some point if you had grabbed like me and one other guy and put us in a warehouse and hit us with a wrench over and over and over again, you could have eventually stolen a hundred million dollars. And uh, that's the problem with holding other people's Bitcoin in a nutshell. It doesn't matter how trustworthy you are. It matters how trustworthy your organization is. And I don't care if you raise $50 million, you're not gonna build Fort Knox. Fort Knox costs a lot more than $50 million. Cold storage is not a reliable way to secure a large amount of Bitcoin. It just isn't. So uh, Bitcoin, what you're used to in Bitcoin, normal Bitcoin addresses when they start with a one. The address is created by hashing the public key and putting a one in front. And so when you send money to that address, to be able to respend that money, what you have to prove to the Bitcoin network is that you're in control of the public key that hashes to that address. So when you publish the redemption, what you're publishing is a description of which inputs you want to select, a, des a description of the outputs of where you're sending the money, and then you sign that whole thing with a public key, and you include the public key along with the transaction. And the miner, well, yeah, with the private key, with the key pair. And you include the public key that's part of that key pair along with the transaction. And the miner, before they decide to include the transaction in the block to take the transaction fee, looks at the inputs to make sure they haven't already been spent. And then they look at the public key to make sure it hashes to the address. And then they look at the outputs to make sure they're real Bitcoin addresses. And if all of that checks out, then they put the transaction in the block and they get to keep the mining fee. Multi-sig addresses are not generated from a simple key pair. Uh, the technology is called pay to script hash. And the way you create the address is you write a script that has to be followed to respend money deposited in that address. The most common script is called M of N. There are this many keys that can sign transactions coming out and you need a quorum of this lesser number of keys or lesser or equal to number of keys to sign a transaction. So very popular is what we did here, which is two of three. These three public keys are capable of signing a, uh, an, an output, and you need at least two of them to actually sign to make a valid transaction. And that script that defines both the rule set and lists the public keys that participate in the rule set, you take that entire script and you make a hash of that, and you throw a three in front, and that's how you get a multi-sig address. So the address itself isn't actually referring to a key pair. The address is referring to a script that lists a bunch of keys. And so when you respend, when you deposit money in that address, if you want to respend that money, what you do is you provide that entire redemption script, the rule set and what public keys are involved in that address. And then you provide the inputs that you want to spend and the outputs that you want to send to. And then you have to sign it with a quorum of those keys. And then that whole package, which can be a fairly large file, that it lists the public keys, it lists the rule set, it lists the inputs, it lists the outputs, it lists the transaction fee, and it lists the signatures from the quorum of those keys. So we'll that whole them. batch is a transaction. And the mining network interprets the script and checks the signatures as part of their verification that the transaction is valid before they include it. So the, the wallet is essentially managing the kind of creation of 
those different addresses and then the That's history, right. and then the kind of collection of all them from the individual parties until it's a complete thing that this, is put on the blockchain. This process right here, when it listed out those addresses, what was happening here is this wallet was creating a redemption script for each address and then hash involving an iterative key from the seeds for all three of those keychains. So, so and the, then creating a multisig address from that. So the addresses that start with a three, those are in the blockchain? Yeah. And that's a hash of the script? Yeah, the, the addresses that start with a three are a hash of the script that describes what you need to do to respect. But the wallet itself, I guess the, the code has to be Somebody could compromise the code and just kind of have all the have all the inputs. So this this wallet right here is only managing one of those three keys. It's got one full set of private and public keys, and then it's got two extended public keys that can be used to derivatively create public keys, but not private keys. So once these once these addresses have been created, compromising funds that have been deposited into them. It's not enough to just compromise this wallet because this wallet can only provide one out of the required two signatures. But I think, are you getting at the, the, at the point at which you generate? The generation step is compromisable yeah. because there's a point at which you generate them and you have all the information at once. That's right, which so, is why, which is one of the things that makes us different than most of our competition is we require you to do the generation locally and we also do it locally. So for the script hash generation, um, the addresses you generate happen on your servers. We generate the same set of addresses on our servers. And if we're not involved in a transaction, the user's not getting communication from us. So you can describe in your fact, because you're working with us, what they should expect to see from us. And a compromised, an attacker who compromised the generation of your system, if he hasn't compromised our system, the users aren't going to get the UX they're expecting, and we're going to find out pretty fast. I guess what I'm trying to figure out is, even outside the kind of implementation, if, if uh, I said, hey, let's create a multi-sig wallet together, then I think the general theory behind it is I kind of have my secret, you have your secret, and they have to both be there to, to That's unlock right. it, right? So if we just say, go create a wallet. The secrets never need to be present on the same computer at the same time, because you only have to communicate the public keys to create the yeah. wallet. So you, so I'm trying to step through the process here. You've created something with that kind of long sentence, uh, and that is just the kind of seed. That's the seed for the private keys that are resident in this wallet. And then and one then party goes off and does something secret, and the other party goes off and does something secret, and somehow those come together. To so the my server's already done something secret. Okay. This did something secret during wallet creation when it created those seeds. Mm -hmm. We exchange the public sides of those secrets, but not the private sides. And since we both do the generation of the multi-sig addresses locally, mm -hmm. we can compare addresses that we created. Okay. So I guess, yeah, what I was missing was, when you were doing this, your server was off creating its own secret, and you were the only kind of human party involved. That's right. So, so there, there were three secrets involved. One secret was already in this text file. One secret was created locally on this wallet when we created the wallet. And the third secret was created on my server the outside of the control of this computer. And you're doing more than three. Yeah, um, there's no theoretical maximum, but the my, but uh, the guys at BitPay have been trying to do as many M events as they can, and they found the mining network processes transactions that are only so large, and you have their whole redeem script has to be included with transactions, including all the public keys. So the most they've ever been able to get it to process is five of seven. No, where M is five and N is seven. Just because the just because the, the transaction is getting too big, and the transaction is getting too big for the mining network to read. How big fees are they putting attached to this? As big as they could. The, the, uh, given given unlimited fees, they couldn't get the mining network to relay transactions large enough. What's wrong with the miners? Well, no, I mean, it's, right. oh, it. So we we really think about two different use cases. Use case number one: um, instead of having a hot wallet, you have your own signing service and you use us as a policy authorizer to get you out of holding money, right? Because we don't work for you, we work for the users. And so we, we will stop you from stealing your users' money. And you can tell the government that, and you can tell your users that. That's one use case. The other use case is um, if the user's got a local wallet, 
we can integrate with their local wallet, their version of Electrum, their version of Multibit, their version of blockchain, and we can stop someone who's compromised their computer from stealing the money. And so, in general, what we want to do is we want to end the practice of holding other people's money in hot and cold wallets, ecosystem-wide. We want to end the threat of malware in your local machine as a way to steal Bitcoin. And we want to dramatically reduce people who obtain Bitcoin by fraud. Mm -hmm. cool. uh, are there any cases for like how you could reach your local, like you went uh, two or three and two, and two people like lost their, so, their keys amount? Generally in Bitcoin, losing keys loses access to funds. Right. We don't solve that problem, but we do make it a little bit better. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. There is no way to solve that problem without holding somebody else's money. Yeah, the, uh, we have an API, and how it works is you structure the transaction locally in your wallet. And let me see if I can go back to the transaction. And you provide us with the transaction that you structure. There it is right there. That's the transaction. You provide us with the transaction structure with all the inputs and with your signature. And at that point, we'll authorize it. And we'll interpret, you know, does it break the velocity? Is it going to a uh, known fraudster? You know, except all of the different things we use to risk score it. And if it's a low risk score, we'll just countersign it and propagate it. And it won't be any slower than propagation normally is. And if it's a medium risk score, then we'll call the user first or we'll email the user first or we'll ask for an OTP from the user or some other way to authorize the user outside of your wallet in a way that you can't circumvent. And if it's a high risk transaction, we'll tell you to go fuck yourself in the call cops. Are we recording that? <laughs> <laughs> Let's say it's a two FTP. Two and the two parties that are not on your server sign a transaction that would meet your high risk criteria. Can you send a message saying, hey, we saw something on this multi so like we didn't control it. So the contract with the third party is gonna vary over time. Uh, it depends on what your use case is when you build the application. Um, user wallets, the user actually has both keys, where they'll have um, they'll have the wallet key, and then they'll have a, the deterministic seed for their recovery key, and they can manually countersign transactions without us, and they're not beholden to us. In that case, all we're really going to do is we're going to notify them, you know, hey, you manually countersigned a transaction. There's nothing we can do to stop it when you do that. If you didn't do that, it's time to freak that. It's time to freak out. Like we can't protect you anymore if you didn't do that, right? If it's a use case where you're doing, you're holding somebody else's coins, and we're standing between them and you, and we call that a mediated wallet. In that case, the third party is usually going to be a top five law firm. And if they're coordinating without notifying us, then uh, we call the bar. And you pro. It's possible to do one of. Like it, one of five, one of seven. It is, and uh, in that case, I don't know why you would want or need us, because the because the input that we use to judge to part sign a transaction is a proposed partially signed transaction. No, I, it just wouldn't go through your. I was just, as far as the multi sig. Yeah, yeah. M can be one. Well, if you want to know who's spending money. That's right. So, you, so you have a wallet that's shared between multiple parties, and everybody has the ability to spend on it but you want to know who spent it, such as a, a joint checking account with your wife where you both have debit cards. So if I'm summarizing you guys to somebody who's not Bitcoin or not technical, it's kind of like we, we look at transactions or we monitor your money and so if there's a suspicious transaction, we try and interrupt you. That's right. So we do that thing that Visa does, where when you try to spend, we look at the transaction, we either approve it or decline it. And based on how much it bothers us, we may do more work. Which is the same thing that he says. Visa makes pretty good business. Mm -hmm. What do you do for fraud training? How do you develop this model in the first place? So what we started with are financial industry best practices, which are remember payees, remember payors, enforce velocity limits, and introduce delays when things are weird. From there, we're going to acquire a data set the old-fashioned way. Yeah. And uh, this is why we're taking the B2B to C approach, 
where we're not trying to add users one at a time. We're trying to add applications that have users one at a time. So if, um, if you've got a Bitcoin wallet that's got more than 100,000 users or so, I will pay you to use our service. Mm -hmm. Uh, how specific are the, are the, I mean, without getting into details, different applications may have different fraud criteria or signals. And how much do you expect to go into specifics of those data sets rather than have a general fraud picture? Uh, we expect that there will be different emergent patterns. For, for consumer wallet use cases, where it really is between us and the consumer and the wallet vendors just shipping code. Um, in those scenarios, we're just going to have to train the model to understand each consumer and to understand each merchant. And so we can see what average behavior is for a consumer. We can see what average behavior is for a merchant. And when somebody tries to spend $30,000 at a gas station, we swoop down. Um, when it comes to application-specific things, for maybe somebody builds a uh, Satoshi Dice competitor that holds, its, that holds its fund house fund with us, or maybe somebody builds a... Uh, a brokerage thing like Coinbase, a bit Oasis guys are building something like that. And they, they presented here a few weeks ago. Um, that might have a different model because they're looking for trade fraud as well as transaction fraud, right? Um, all that stuff, we're just going to have to learn application by application. Some of them, the application will know what they're looking for and they'll outsource some of that logic to us so their application can't be compromised. And some of it, we're just going to have to watch them. You know, I mean, the same way Visa wants. Who's your biggest competitor and why are you better than them? Our biggest competitor is Trusted Coin. Okay. They got started before us. They also have a multi-sig API that doesn't care what wallet you're using. Um, we are already integrated with the fork of a mass market wallet and we'll be integrated with mainstream mass market wallets, multiple of them within the next few months. They've been around over a year and they built their own proprietary wallet and released it as open source. It's the only one they're integrated with. Also, they do in transactions one at they do addresses one at a time with their API. They mm. won't do HD wallets, mm. which can be very limiting for your application. Also, they generate all the redeem scripts server side, so you don't know whether or not you trust them. Mm. Bitco only works with their own wallet, not with any other wallets. And they, as far as I know, they don't have any intention to integrate with any wallets. So, Bitco is. It's its own ecosystem. It's not, it's not going to be part of the general multi-purpose, multi-party, multi-sig ecosystem. It'd be great if they were, but they're just not engaging with those communities. Um, there's another wallet like them called Green Address. That's also, it's a multi-sig wallet, but it only works with itself. Um, honestly, I would love to see BitGo pivot to compete with us. I think it would be better for the ecosystem. When you're dealing with a vendor where they're writing the code that ships to you in a browser at login time, and they're also holding the other key, to me, that multi-sig is a gimmick. They're your counterpart. They're holding your Bitcoin. If they want to lava bit attack you, they will. And just in Bitcoin, what we want to see is we want to see getting rid of Bitcoin counterparties. Uh, people whose primary business is holding other people's money in Bitcoin have raised about $100 million in venture financing, and they've lost over a billion dollars in customer funds. Bitcoin, ha as an industry, has the worst oh, reputation oh, 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 for counterparties. <laughs> One company has raised over, the only companies that have raised mostly up to $160 million have been exchanges. Now, so, the biggest exchange that lost the most money was not a venture. All, so Gox lost about half a, million, half a billion dollars. Correct. They're the big one. Bitfloor lost 30,000 points. Too shit. <laughs> <laughs> Still less than a billion. InstaWallet <laughs> lost, like, what, 86,000 points? True. Yeah. <laughs> Silk Road <laughs> lost 120,000 points. <laughs> My point is, is that as an ecosystem, we have failed. Yes. And we are not deserving of trust. But, is, but because we're not financial management software engineers, nor are we financial management security professionals. But Bitcoin, because of multi-party multi-sig, doesn't require us to be. It just requires us to stop thinking we are. I don't know, but you said you, you argued a great point. You're doing data analysis on transactions. You're, you're looking.
looking at how people are you know, looking at behaviors. I mean, if I didn't know better, you sound very much like a security company. I don't really do one. We feel very much like a security company. And our backgrounds are at security. Like I said, at Trade Hill, we were holding 100,000 of other people's coins worth 1,000 bucks each, and we give them back. Um, we, had a, we, had a, we had a database that was doing all of our transaction matching using uh, stored procedures. So our database was literally incapable of saving a balance that didn't happen through the possible business process. We, uh, only the stored procedures have write capability. Um, before Trade Hill, my co-founder Miran, who's the co-founder of both companies, the technical founder Tradle, and he was the, and he's my co-founder for CryptoCorp. Before here, he was a security engineer in Google's compliance group. He did a cryptography behind their um, their payment gateway for Google Wallet. He also did the tool that authorizes employee access to Gmail and other confidential uh, uh, consumer information, and he did their OFAC compliance tool. So when it comes to the intersection of cryptography, compliance, and security. We're, I'd say, one of the best teams in Bitcoin. Uh, we're yeah, adding. Teams like you, I've never heard, I mean, that's a pretty impressive background. Do you have other teams like you in the industry? With the competitors like Bitco, it doesn't seem to have the security background that you have. I mean, um, I know that Bitco has investors from PayPal. <laughs> <laughs> if it works. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, maybe maybe they're getting good advice. Do you, do you foresee a way to, like, uh, to roll this into providing some kind of guarantee on the customer side, like limited liability up to $100 worth or something like that? So we are going to buy insurance against uh, professional liability. So when we make the wrong call on signing a transaction, you'll be able to go to our insurance company. And if you can get a court to agree that our rules say we shouldn't have signed it, but we did anyway, if we broke the contract in signing it, then our insurance company will pay out. If we signed it appropriately according to the contract, you're shit out of luck. You know, how, how does it work for Visa by comparison? Uh, Visa also has something like that, where a Visa makes the wrong decision according to the decisions they're supposed to make. If they de like deliberately make the wrong decision or something like that, then they're liable and they'll pay out. But if, uh, if fraud happened honestly, <laughs> then, uh, then it's not Visa's problem. So, I mean, I guess, I guess here. But, in, but in general, when you have somebody who's processing a transaction who's not holding the money, it's very difficult to hold them liable, assuming they did what they said they were going to do. Even if the transaction resulted in fraud or the transaction resulted in theft, so long as they weren't actively encouraging the fraud or the theft, you're probably not going to find it. That said, if a service wanted to get a rider insurance policy, that for the purpose of the users of that application, it protected more than that, then we'd be absolutely happy to talk to the insurance company about what we do and about how we help prevent bad things. Okay. If, if your user says, hey, calls up say, my computer's compromised, you know, we got hacked, you know, shut everything down from my side. You yeah. have this procedure in place that sort of contact the third party law firm and then you know, sort of sweep coins. Yes. Um, generally speaking, we would sweep in the instance where the counterparty was compromised, like the other application, or in a circumstance where the other company was being so unreliable that uh, we felt like we were at risk from the user's wrath because our partner was screwing us. I guess just, just to go back to the Visa thing, I mean, my assumption, I'm not an expert, but my assumption is that it's sort of a matter of intent. Like, if, if, if there are transactions that I didn't intend to happen, I'm surprised when I see them. You know, I assume that my liability is limited. You know, I don't, I don't know. Why. So, but that's not Visa providing that guarantee. And you pay 4%. That's, so that's, you're issuing bank providing that guarantee and the agreements that they have with merchant banks requiring them to back it up. Um, I'll give you an example. I've got an Amex card, right? I go to a store. I buy a suit. I swipe my Amex card. I go home, I give the suit to a bum, I take a picture of the bum in the suit, I call Amex, I say, hey Amex, this bum stole my credit card and I found him the next day wearing a nice new suit. Many things can happen over the next 30 days and somebody will pay for that suit, but I can promise you who's not going to pay for that suit. 
Amex. <laughs> That's right. They're, they're in the middle of entities that could get stuck with that bill. But they are not one of the entities that's going to get signed up. So that whole suite thing that you mentioned, um, I mean, I could see that if you're dealing with directly with consumers, you're going to probably see that a lot. So, but I guess you're not. No, that's really we won't. We won't be dealing with directly with consumers. We'll, we'll deal with wallet companies and we'll deal with applications. When we deal with a wallet company, each wallet is going to have its own secret. And there's no need to do a sweep thing like that. Well, if one of those wallet secrets gets compromised, how then we can sweep that individual wallet. But we don't have to coordinate with a law firm to do that, because in the case where the, we're dealing with a user and their wallet is a secret, the user had both secrets at account creation time. There is no law firm in that case. The reason for a law firm is if we're partnering with somebody for an application that handles third parties' money. So if we're partnering with Coinbase that handles their users' money or with BitOasis or Bitstamp. In that scenario, we would say, listen, in the average scenario, you're going to propose and we're going to countersign. And that's going to be normal and that's what we're going to normally going to do. But we need protection in case you go away. And you need protection in case we go away. So let's have a law firm that we agree in the average month we'll sign zero transactions. But we'll remain with the technical power to countersign one of us. In case one of us goes away forever, and these will help sweep the funds for all sweep the funds for all of the users. So when it comes, I mean, one of the other advantages of multi-sig is just if I lose my password, I can recover it by talking to the parties. You know. So it depends on how you structure the wallet. How we're structuring one-party wallets is we're forcing them to provide us with two secrets at wallet creation: the one that's embedded in the wallet, and another one which we're requiring them to allege that they have written down and stored somewhere. We're actually asking them to allege that they've written both down and stored them somewhere. And at this point, if you want to recover your wallet wallet, you can by going back to that secret, and that se all of the keys that were in your wallet can be derived from that secret. So, I mean, it's like an everyday occurrence somebody forgets their password, right? So That's right. Like, and right. I'm just a, a user, you know, grandma who created a wallet, and I forget my password, then I could just, I, that's between me and the wallet. So, the, so there's a big difference between wallets and accounts in Bitcoin. And there are a lot of companies that issue accounts that call them wallets that really confuse them. If you're not signing transactions on your local computer in a way that no one you're working with can fake, then you don't have a wallet. Wallets handle keys that sign transactions. That's what wallets do. That's what Electrum does, it's what Multibit does, it's what blockchain does. So what have I got a Coinbase? You've got an account. You've got an account. Where you've got an account that's denominated in Bitcoin, that they owe you, that they're alleging that they're storing. But you don't have any keys and you can't sign transactions. Right. All you can do is say, I want you to send Bitcoin for me to this place. If grandma forgets her password at Coinbase, Coinbase can help her change her password. If grandma forgets her password on blockchain, then what blockchain has to ask for is grandma, that thing we told you to write down when you created your account, we need that to change your password. Do you still have it? And don't lose so it. I'm just buying it out. So I want to make sure you have it all the time. Well, I need a third, third signature. signature. So, so one, the one of the uses of our API will be um, having us stand between you and a counterparty, like we were talking about for an application. That can be just between you and a counterparty for a single transaction. Okay. In which case, You'd have, um, you'd have a wallet, and you'd provide in your account configuration the key you put here is the key for the guy who's selling the house. Right. Right? right. And so it creates a two of three wallet where the three parties are you, me, and the guy who's selling the house. Right. Now you're buying three cents. You, me, and three. Sure. Okay? Then you put the money in. It goes in there. One sec, where is it? Where is it generating? Can you time it up so after that 30 days, the bond goes back to you? You can, you can build whatever policies you want. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you put the money in there. Mm -hmm. When you try to spend from there, we're going to call him. And we're going to say, is the transaction off? Right. 
And he's going to say, yes, the transaction offer, we're going to spend the money. Or he's going to say, no, man, he's got to take my house. Give me that money. And I'm going to say, he hasn't signed yet. Don't you dare. That's right. And <laughs> if he tries to take the money out, then we call you right. and we say, do you have a house yet? So you're going to need double authorization from me. You need to send me money. Then you need to release So you put, the money, you put the money in. And then, and then our, back, and now we work for the it. we work for the contract and for the money, not right. for you, not for him. Right. And so if he tries to withdraw, we ask you. If you try to withdraw, we ask him. Right. If you guys can't agree, we wait for a judge to tell us what to do. Or until the contract is back. If that's what the contract says. Okay. Good. Uh, what about altcoins? Uh, we love altcoins, but what we love most are transactions per day. Is that how we make money? <laughs> <laughs> And so, when any altcoins okay, have enough so transactions we, we, we per day, you'll switch over. Yep. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> Anything that enables something like threshold signing or PTSH or some other technology that enables our business model, once it gets enough transactions per day, that we want the money. Okay. But we'll for now, it. it's Bitcoin. Because Bitcoin right. is the only yeah, cryptocurrency. Yeah, yeah. And for the foreseeable future, it's going to stay that way. Uh, you said it, not me. I know. But I'm guessing. I'm coin agnostic. Okay. So if we were to work with Coinbase, I didn't say we're working with Coinbase, we tell Brian that. <laughs> if we worked with Coinbase, then what we would probably do is a three phase migration. Phase number one, let's get their hot wallet multisig now. So it doesn't walk away, right? Let's just impose global velocity one time. Phase number two, without changing their UX, let's reorient how their hot wallet works to make it not a pooled hot wallet, but instead a signing oracle that seg segregates the money by user and signs transactions appropriate to the accounts, right? And that, that would be stage number one if it's a new application. And then stage number three, Three, stage number two, if it's a new application, is for advanced users that would like to tie a different wallet to this account. Maybe they've got a copay wallet, or maybe they're working with one of the mass market wallets that we're bringing to market soon. They can throw in that key too. Instead of them being at two out of three Coinbase OS lawyer, it becomes two out of four Coinbase OS lawyer user. And so yeah. Hmm? Yeah. And we're the one who's programmatically enforcing policy. So we're the one that everybody should try to work with. Because right, we're the reliable one. They could. They'd have to develop they'd have to develop a method for sharing the partial sent transactions. But presumably it wouldn't be hard. But you would be able to see after the fact who who, who which parties. If we saw if we saw Coinbase or another application partner often collaborating with the wallet and cutting us out of the transaction, then we would probably ask them to just still pay us our fees because we're sitting here being available for them, being integrated with their application, running potential liability. So cutting us out of the transaction on an ongoing basis as part of your application is not a good way to build a good partnership and save money on fees. You have to choose. You're either going to save money on fees or you're going to build a good Final question. Can you talk just a little bit about, uh, about the signatures to start with three, and then because like you said, the ones that start with one. Are so three addresses. Three. Yeah. So, so you can you be used as things for anything else, right? But like they're just like they're just for this multi-sig signing, right? So multi-sig addresses are legitimate Bitcoin addresses, just okay. like the ones that start with the one. You can send money to them. Yes. In fact, they're not useful until they've received money. Just like normal Bitcoin addresses. Okay. There's no signing a transaction do we spend money that's not there. So they're interchangeable. Yeah. Okay. But they're just created through a different They're created through a different process. Okay. And then they follow a different process to create legitimate transactions to respend what's deposited in there. Okay. But that's it. Okay, they're, they're technically they're, they're They so are normal Bitcoin addresses and you can send money to them. You can do one of one. You can do you can make a one address in that's right. And all you're and then all you're doing is saying fuck you to the miners by getting into the transactions. Okay. <laughs> uh, are you okay? Are you burning? Awesome question. Yeah, I just have one quick 
profession. Um, <laughs> so um, uh, one of the reasons you might want to hold your customer's money is to uh, create relationships with drip payments or micro payments between your users. Um, batch settlement. Right. Oh, so you're saying you do this. We, we, we don't mind doing batch settlement. Are you guys hiring? Looking for talent? Absolutely. So um, if you have done UX for any major financial brand, if you have contributed code into Bitcoin wallets, especially Bitcoin J or Bitcoin JS, if you um, want to work with the top brands in the industry, want to contribute to top five wallets, or if you're building a Bitcoin application that handles money on the server side, all of those are very, very good reasons to call me. We pay very well. Um, we're looking for advisors. We're looking for wallet engineers and we're looking for UX people. Thank you.